Hi, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now, reporting on ULAR 2023, specifically on Still's disease and systemic JIA at ULAR 2023. Maybe the highlight of the meeting was the ULAR 2023 guidelines on systemic JIA and Still's disease, and that's a separate video that you can also see where you watch your Room Now videos or listen to the podcast. In this report, I'm going to go over the other abstracts and research presented at the meeting that I thought was really novel. And I'm going to begin with uh, abstract 1484 by Fontana et al. that looked at predictors of drug-free remission in a cohort of uh, seven, 64 uh, stills patients, 57 adults, 7 kids. Uh, and really the goal of this was to look at drug-free remission and what the predictors were. Um, this wasn't a strong abstract, but it did say two things that are really worth noting. Number one, in these 64 patients, drug-free remission was achieved in 36% of patients uh, during the follow-up period and after a median of 3.6 years. This sort of gets into the issue as to how long am I gonna have the systemic disorder doc? And, you know, I always say eight months to eight years, and I have no way of knowing what's in between. And most of the reports I see fall within that range. You know, if you had disease that lasted two, three months, I don't know that's really Stills disease. So um, I like that part. The other predictive feature that they had in here was hyperleukocytosis, which I, which I think they defined as greater than 15,000 white count, which I wouldn't say that's really hyper, but, you know, it's another uh, hyperinflammatory biomarker, meaning that it's easier to go from high inflammation to low inflammation at some point. I'm not sure I believe that that's a potential predictor of remission, but that was their one takeaway uh, from this report. Uh, I want to go back to the uh, important point on the guidelines. The guidelines, what was great about them is that it's now Stills disease. It's no longer adult onset Stills disease or systemic onset JIA. They were very big about saying it's the same disorder, it's an age continuum, and uh, from now on we should call it Stills disease, whether it's in a kid or an adult. And I think that that was really helpful for those of us who manage these patients. My next abstract is OP0257 from Farina et al. It's a report of long-term outcomes of canakinumab use in adult onset stills disease patients. They had 25 patients who had received canakinumab for more than 12 months. I think the median here was 24 months. The cohort that they, that they looked at had a median onset age at age 35. It's a little on the high side, ranging from 22 to 56, certainly acceptable. They certainly fit the profile of adult onset stills disease. Um, and, and I think that the um, most frequent reason uh, for using an IL-1 inhibitor was persistent disease activity. So canakinumab did lead to remission in 23 out of the 25 patients and was associated with significant reduction in steroid use, activity scores, CRP, ferritin, etc. So again, um, and no major adverse effects. That's encouraging if you use an IL-1 inhibitor chronically in these patients. Abstract 1503 from uh, DeCola and, um, and Rochetti, actually Cola and Rochetti, um, looked at the impact of obesity on outcomes in patients with adult Stills disease. I think a novel approach, I must say that I read everything and, and looked at a lot of things regarding Stills and never really looked at the issue of obesity. And I think this is a novel report. They looked at 139 patients in Italy who had Stills disease and 19% of them had a BMI of greater than 30. The mean age of this cohort was 39 years. Turns out that if you had obesity and Stills disease, you had twofold higher CRP levels. You also had a 72% greater chance or a twofold greater chance of having a chronic disease course. And lastly, it was a, a predictor of failure of at least one or more biologic DMARDs. A lot of what we've seen in other diseases is that obese patients have worse disease and are less likely to respond. 
So in this cohort, they showed that obesity adds to the inflammatory burden of patients with Stills disease. Uh, and they also showed that obesity was not associated with monocyclic or polycyclic systemic disease, nor life-threatening complications, but as I said, was associated with chronic persistent disease. Novel report from Cola and Roschetti. OP0034 from Foal et al. looked at um, serum calprotectin as a distinguisher between systemic JIA and other inflammatory diseases. Um, and they, so that this is a pediatric an analysis looking at calprotectin specifically what's called um, myeloid related protein eight, uh, MRP eight and MRP 14. Uh, and you know, we talked about that previously on room now as a potential biomarker and distinguisher for systemic JIA. So this is a follow-up and a repeat of the same study. Uh, 650 kids, 100 of whom had systemic JIA compared to 169 with JIA without systemic disease, 51 infections, 161 inflammatory disorders, 147 leukemias, uh, 23 healthy controls. What's novel about this report was instead of doing an ELISA for uh, calprotectin or MRP8-14, they did this turbidometric, um, an immunoturbidometric assay. Uh, they did show excellent 0.99 correlation um, between the ELISA for MRP8-14 uh, and their assay um, so that you can combine these results with other assays of calprotectin. Again, calprotectin is the same as MRP8-14. It is the same as S100A8-A9. These are all S100 in proteins expressed by myeloid cells, neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages. Um, and, uh, and what they showed was it significantly distinguished systemic JIA kids with a sensitivity at a cutoff of 9100 picograms per ml, sensitivity 93%, specificity 87%, area under the courage 0.961. Again, I like this. Um, I think this is probably the test we should be doing for diagnosis and probably the test we should be following in patients with systemic JIA, Stills disease, or adult Stills disease. Uh, a novel report from um, Bindoli and colleagues, abstract 1307, um, looked at uh, response to the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, vaccine uh, in patients receiving IL-1 inhibitors. And basically they showed that IL-1 inhibition when being used by uh, uh, patients with systemic auto-inflammatory diseases had no effect uh, and did not impair um, a humor response to uh, the COVID vaccine. And I think that's something we don't see much of in the reports. That's why I thought it was worth mentioning here. Lastly, a really novel report on lung disease in systemic JIA. You know, this has kind of been a hot button issue in the pediatric rheumatology world. Um, really nice poster by Bracaglia and as the first author and Dee Benedetti is the last author. Big European effort poster uh, POS 0277, systemic JIA associated with lung disease in a European, co European cohorts. Basically, they uh, collected 34 patients with systemic JIA who developed lung disease between 2007 and 2022. Um, uh, 33 of the 34 were Caucasian. The mean age of systemic JIA was six years. And then uh, a median of two years later, would they develop the onset of chronic lung disease? Like has, has been suggested in other reports, mainly from the United States, the lung disease included 70% um, ILD, 18% uh, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, and 12% with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, what can you say about this? Uh, of the patients, the 34 they described, 19 had chronic persistent systemic JIA, 14 a polycyclic course, one monocyclic. 85% um, had active systemic JIA at the time of their lung disease diagnosis. Um, of these lung disease patients, 82% of them developed macrophage activation syndrome. 
uh, a third of them with the systemic JA onset and half of them having it um, uh, MAS at the time of their lung disease diagnosis. I think that's really kind of ominous, is it not? Um, it, uh, the 82% of these were on an IL-1 or an IL-6 inhibitor at the time of their lung diagnosis. It was felt that there was an adverse drug reaction to the IL-1 or the IL-6 inhibitor in about 38% of these cases. Nine cases with tocilizumab, four with anakinra. That's one of the issues here. Is this a DRESS syndrome, a reaction to the IL-1 or IL-6 inhibitor? Uh, and, and I think that there's some evidence of that. 44% uh, of them had digital clubbing and it came on pretty quick and that's something to look for in adults or kids with this. Half of them had hypoxia um, and half the patients required ICU admission and six out of the 34, 18% died. So, you know, Stills disease doesn't kill anybody. The drugs we use for Stills disease, mainly steroids, are where you get problems or if you develop MAS, that's where you can, as a, a significant morbid and if not mortal risk. But this lung disease thing, which happens in extreme minority of Stills patients, um, uh, could lead to death. And that's why it's important to recognize it. Whether this is a, a, a reaction to chronic IL-1 or IL-6 inhibition is still unknown. There is an HLA haplotype associated with that. Uh, I think we need more research. In my experience, I've seen a few patients develop, adults develop chronic lung disease. Um, I stop the IL-1 inhibitor and move on to other therapies. Um, and I, I don't know there is a right way to do this, but check out the video on uh, the ULAR um, guidelines for Stills disease and there's some discussion of that there. Uh, tune in for more from ULAR 2023 at Room Now.